What's up, you guys? Henry Gracie and Alex Ueda here at the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Academy World Headquarters for one of the most important discussions we've ever had with you guys. Now, for those who don't know, Alex is one of the head instructors here at the Gracie Academy, probably the best kids class Gracie Bullyproof instructor you've ever seen. Unbelievable and without a doubt has the nicest hair in the Gracie Academy. Alex is the kind of student who, um, student and instructor who when you miss a week or you do, you're gone for a little while or you miss a class last week, you come to Alex and you say, yo, what did they show last week? And Alex will give you a personal one-on-one -on -one breakdown of what you missed that was probably better than the class that I actually taught based on all the research and gathering and experience and trial and error of the technique that he utilized. So couldn't have a better partner here for this discussion today. And the discussion is one that we need to be detailed about. We need to get into the deep breakdown on injuries. Injuries in Jiu Jitsu. Injuries are either the best or the worst thing that can happen to your Jiu Jitsu. It depends on how you roll with them. We're going to talk about the common causes, the treatment tips, and most importantly, the training modifications for the top five injuries in Jiu Jitsu. If you would use these training modifications properly, you will essentially be able to make your injuries work for you. The same way Andy Gracie made his weaknesses and his frailness work for him, if you know what I mean. Now, top five injuries, lower back, neck, knees, shoulders, and ears. And of course, there are a few honorable mentions we're gonna talk about at the end there. Now, we need to start by letting them know that neither one of us are doctors. We didn't go to medical school. We don't know anything about that, except for one thing. We have seen more jujitsu injuries between myself, Alex, and of course all the other instructors here at the Gracie Academy who I spoke with about this video before making it, we have seen more jujitsu injuries than any doctors you know. So that being said, we qualify to speak on what you can do to avoid them, and if it happens, what you can do to get back on the mat as fast as possible. Because we know that when an injury happens, what does everyone want to do? They want to be out for one day, maybe two days, then they want to go train again. And we're saying this, do not rush back to training. Listen to your doctor. Rest and ice in the first 24 hours of an injury is the most important thing, okay? How your body heals in that first 24 hours, it's gonna swell up, it's gonna happen, you're gonna ice it, try to keep the inflammation down, you're gonna rest it, you're not gonna re-aggravate it, it's gonna decide the, the projection of healing effectiveness that you're gonna create for that injury, and uh, that's the most important thing. And then of course, whatever else your doctor prescribes for your particular injury. However, we know that few of you are gonna to listen to your doctor and stay off the mat as long as you should. That being said, if you're gonna jump on the mat early, do it correctly, intelligently, and as most importantly, safely, so you don't re-aggravate the same injury, which could eventually lead to a chronic injury of the same type, which is the worst case scenario. All right, Alex, before we get deep into the details for these top five injuries, let's explain to them why injuries happen. All right, so guys, Typically, if you already have kind of the nice training environment you're looking for and mm. very chill training partners, the main cause of injuries is having two people who get a little short-sighted and care too much. They care too much about the engagement, the particular engagement. How can we illustrate this? Perfect analogy. Let's say we have a rubber band right here, okay? This represents a struggle maybe between me and Henner. Let's say I land an arm lock on Henner Henner is completely determined so you go not for the to arm let lock. it happen. I'm, I'm determined to, to get out. He's determined to catch it. I'm determined to get out. He's more determined to catch it. I'm more determined to get out. You okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, every rubber band will break eventually. And what we mean by that is it doesn't matter how in good a shape you are, how flexible you are, how you know, athletic you are, how strong you are. If you're stretched to a certain point, it breaks. Absolutely. You're a physics guy, you went to UCLA, you know what's up. Mm -hmm. No matter how strong you're a man, it eventually breaks, right? They have machines that test things like that, right? Yeah. That test the strength of certain things. You guys, I don't care how strong your bands are, they will break if you care too much. Now, on another illustration, this is how you should be training. I catch the arm lock, Alex says, okay. Alex goes to get out all crazy, I go, okay. Do you understand? It gets to a point where we're more concerned with each other's safety than with ripping someone's arm off. Now, that doesn't mean you can't catch a submission. It doesn't mean you can't win. It just means that you understand the rubber band analogy, the rubber band analogy. And you understand that 
No arm lock is worth either person's rubber band breaking. What's the rubber band? It could be a neck, it could be a shoulder, it could be a back, a lower back. The bottom line is you don't get so emotional that you just bop, you rip it. Every time there's tension, you say, well, that's a little too tight. We're carrying a little too much. Let's calm down a little bit and let's train another day. Okay, point made. Lower back. Alex, tell us some of the common causes, and we're gonna start with this one, not only because I really do think it's the top of the list, I haven't surveyed every jujitsu practitioner, mm -hmm. but I know that it's the one that sidelined me for 10 months. When I was 19, 20 years old, I was out of the game because I herniated a disc in my lower back, and uh, I'll show you how it happened to me, and then we'll show some other positions that can be equally threatening for the lower back. 285 pound training partner, triangle setup. Boom! I was like 19 years old. I'm like, yeah, I'm triangle mastery. What's up? This guy came forward, cross grip right here, and stack me up. It's my keep my shoulders on the ground mm -hmm. and just push my hips to my chest. Walk forward more, more, more. Yeah, hip, 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 hip. That's what happened right there. But imagine 285 pounds. You can get off. Mm -hmm. 285 pounds pushing my my pelvic structure into my chest. It's gonna bend my. It's gonna flex. It's gonna curl my low back so aggressively that. The spine could not withstand, the spine was not strong enough, that rubber band was not strong enough in that angle to withstand that much pressure. So the disc slipped out of position and it was bad. It was really bad. Talk about some other positions that may jeopardize the spine. Yeah, guys, in addition to that, what we call a shallow stack where uh, your hips are pushing your chest, there's also the deep stack where the knees are pulled sort of over the face yes. and all the weight is taken on the cervical vertebrae. Yeah, so there's definitely different angles, right? And when the, the higher the stack is, the more it's a neck injury. Now for a lower back, the hips are lower, folding in. Another position is the, the back mount. The back mount I see a lot of times where people oh, yeah. are getting it and they're jacking each other, whether it's a kind of pronated back mount, lock me up with the hooks here. If you ever get your back taken and you're flattened out like this slow and he arches up and drives his hips in the hooks, that's hyper, uh, extension of the spine in a direction that is not supposed to go healthily and that could cause you know injury to the spine uh, even back mount normal back mount right here boom where we fall this way and the say someone's going for a choke lock it up and they start to arch back so bridging your back the other way or bridging too aggressively to escape the mount anytime your back flexes way deeply in the other direction mm. it uh, it, it, it can affect the spine. And the thing is, you won't know until it's too late how far your spine can go. Yeah. Now you get some gymnasts or some people that work for the circus and their spine literally bends back on itself. But they've been doing that since they were, you know, three, four, five, six years old and they developed that level of flexibility and that health in their spine. If you don't have that and then your spine gets compromised, you risk a disc slipping out of position. Now, that's one type of lower back injury. Another type is where you are walking and you slip on some ice and you just tense up or you're one of the facet joints, the inner vertebral body facet joint slips a little bit and your back spasms and locks up. You had that happen recently in the kids class. Yeah, absolutely, it was ridiculous. I was sparring earlier that day. I was probably uh, shallow stacked a little bit during my sparring session, didn't feel a thing. Toward the afternoon, uh, right before the kids class, my back got a little stiff. And then just as I was running, warming up with the kids, one of my heel strikes, something felt weird in my pelvis, in my tailbone area. A little slip. Yeah, and everything locked up. Interesting. So bottom line is it can happen many different ways. What's most important, those are the common causes from a positional perspective, guard stacks, of course twister, like cervical twists, right? Like spinal twists of the column can be very dangerous as well. You want to tap very early. But um, even the silliest thing can happen that causes your back to get injured. Now from a treatment perspective, the most important is to identify whether it is a, um, whether it's a nerve injury, a disc injury, or a muscular injury. Right? So if you slip uh, the vertebrae a little bit and your body locks up, if your muscle spasms, it locks up to protect your spine from not letting that happen again, that's one concern. But if your disc slips out of position and you feel a pain in your leg or in your hips or in your calf or in your toes, that means that your disc is impinging on the actual spinal column, the spinal cord. And that means that you have, might have uh, nerve damage. And that's what I had in my situation. When my disc slipped out of position, I felt sciatic nerve pain down my whole leg for a period of several weeks, but because I didn't have this video to reference, I didn't know the difference. I thought it was a leg injury, like a muscle in my leg because of the shooting sensation down the back here. So I had no idea that that meant my back was injured. And that was the biggest problem because I kept training. Like, I don't care, it's just a leg, sore muscle. I'm gonna go 100%. After several weeks of training, finally me and Hidon were rolling and I bottom of the mount, I trap and rolled and I bridged up really hard, like going crazy mount sparring and it freaking flared up crazy. At that point, I said, man, it feels like someone had a blowtorch on the back of my leg, literally like just a fire the whole time. 
And I thought, this is ridiculous. I couldn't stand up for more than one minute at a time. And that's when I opted to have surgery. I said, whatever this is, I got to take it out. They went in there, they cleaned out a piece of my disc and it took off the pressure immediately, solved the problem and uh, had 10 months of rehab doing the different ball exercises, which you may have seen in my other uh, core strengthening exercise video. Make sure you check that out on YouTube if you're curious about how I rehabbed it. But the moral of the story was, I didn't know it was a freaking nerve thing, a disc thing. And um, that was a big difference. Had I known sooner, I may have taken protective measures and trained more safely and strengthening and flex and stretching and you know traction type rehabilitative exercise could have avoided worsening the injury to where I needed surgery. But I didn't know. So I'm here to tell you guys, as the, what do they call it, the canary in the coal mine? Yeah. Telling you guys, listen, if you feel any pain on your leg, it's way worse than localized muscle spasm pain on your low back. This happened to Alex last week and he's already better. So typically within a week it gets better, unless it's nerve pain, then you'll feel that shooting pain for a while. It doesn't mean you have to have surgery, it just means it's gonna take longer before that, pre that protruding disc kind of alleviates that pressure on the, uh, on the nerve and the, uh, on the spinal cord and the nerves of the spine so that uh, you can get back to training safely and effectively, okay? So regarding treatment of the lower back injury, that's the key. Is it a muscle injury or is it a nerve injury from the bulging disc or moving disc? And uh, make sure you're diagnosed appropriately based on that. All right, training modifications. Basically, how to train and how to modify your training once you've identified you have a spinal injury, a back injury, um, and you're on the re you've already rehabbed, you've listened to your doctor, you're coming back to training, it's time to get back on the mat, you feel ready to go, your body feels better. Um, what's the key? Well, avoid those positions that compromise the spine. Mm -hmm. Back mount, any position where you don't control the flexion, the bending or extension of your spine should be avoided when you are rehabilitating. So we're gonna avoid closed guard, right? And any submissions from the closed guard. We're gonna avoid back mount and we're gonna avoid bridging from the bottom of the mount. So what can we do? Well, you can work open guard, right? Because in open guard, part passing a little bit, put some pressure. In the open guard, I can like more or less control, because I'm not connected to Alex, I can more or less control this. You see, because it's just my legs and my spine is flat, flat on the ground throughout this whole process. So no matter what I'm doing, I'm just, my body's, my, my body's safe right here. I'm not like, latching onto him with my legs. That's number one. Um, uh, number two is if he's mounted on me, I don't, if I have an injured back, I don't want to spend too much time bridging because that activates all the muscles in my glutes and in my low back. So instead, I'm just going to play safe hands, maybe a little bit of elbow escapes here, maybe some top arm through, but none of these require me to bridge and twist my back too wildly to escape the position. So avoiding the back mount, avoiding bridging, and avoiding closed guard connections with your legs is the wisest thing to do. And of course, which is the case for all these injuries, training with someone who is not out of your controlling abilities. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely critical. Cool. And this might not even be like a, a training partner with malicious intent. It could just be a big guy. Who you can't control. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the safest thing. When I'm coming back from injuries, I always find like, okay, where's the like the, you know, 150 pound blue belt, you know what I'm saying? 130 pound woman who I can roll with and just get movement going on, but know that there's nothing they can do that would force me to position myself in a way that I can't control mm. the outcome, you know? And uh, just, there's just less pressure, that's the bottom line. All right, let's talk about the neck. So, neck, cervical injuries, right? C6, C7, most common here. Now, positions that cause neck injuries. The most common one are neck crank type things, can opener type things, right? So being inside someone's guard and moves like this one, boom, or someone will just reach up and grab and pull this, which, you should never be doing on a training partner, really. There's no real benefit to this, if, especially if they're lower level and they don't recognize this and they don't know what to do with it. But this idea of holding his body down and folding his neck right here doesn't give Alex the chance. It's not a choke, number one. He may not recognize it. And number two or three, he doesn't even know what to do about it. He's just gonna try to push my face or push away and I'm gonna be cranking his neck and the egos kick in and suddenly his neck is tweaked. In six weeks, this guy is like, oh, I can't even turn his neck to the side and is you know, possibly feeling nerve pain and shooting residual nerve sensation down his arm and fingers. So that's one. What else do you think, Alex? Uh, like, yeah, like you said, neck manipulations in general. Sometimes, you know, uh, people will do stupid little things like um, not even a cross face, but just kind of like use their arm and boom, uh, yeah. tweak the neck like this. I've also seen this kind of like little nutcracker thing where they turn the chin and bend the neck yeah. just like this. And uh, all it's meant to do is inhibit motion. And sometimes it's, it's hard to believe that just turning your head a little bit yeah. can cause your whole body to be immobilized in the way that it is. 
and uh, because we're incredulous, or because we don't believe in it, we kind of move, twist a little defend, too much. Defend, yeah. It's, a, yeah it's, it's almost like, hey, it's not a real choke, so I'm not gonna tap to this yeah. and then let it go. The deep, the, the deep stack that you talked about from guard, if I have a triangle right. or like an arm lock, let's say, mm -hmm. and we're here, boom, and uh, you're stacking me up, come on mm -hmm. top. Look at the difference between a deep stack and a shallow stack. Shallow, my shoulder's on the ground, and he's pushing my body, like bring, put your hips on my hips a little mm -hmm. more. Yeah, like heavy hip to hip, folding my low back. Deep stack, keep my hips off the ground. My shoulders almost come off the ground. He goes so fast. Look at this, oh, I'll keep going. That, the, my spine is almost vertically aligned over my neck, and that's much more cervical than it is low back. My back is relatively straight, but it's over my neck right here. So that's a very dangerous stack for the neck and one that should be avoided at all costs. But Alex said it, the problem with neck injuries and the reason why they happen is typically your neck gets compromised. Mm -hmm. the, the defendant says, well, this is not a choke and exactly. it's just my neck bending, I'm gonna be okay. Until they get out of it, and I've had this happen where I've gotten stacked up like that on my neck, get out of it, and for three months I'm feeling like a kind of a firing sensation, like shooting the nerves down my hand into my fingertips. Right, where you feel like, wow, like little tingling, numbing sensation on the fingertips here. And that means that the disc in your neck slipped out of position, protruded on the, on the spinal cord, and is affecting. When it's neck injury, you typically you feel it in the shoulder blades and in the arms. When it's lower back, you feel it in the legs and the hips, for obvious reasons, in terms of affecting the nerve and how that shoots down your leg or upper body. So I feel these residual sensation, and it might take two, three months before that goes away if you train safely. And this is without surgery in the neck, by the way. I just let it go, really calm, didn't let anybody touch my head for three months, and finally started feeling better. So it just takes the highest level of precaution in terms of the um, not letting people mess with your neck and, and touch it. Now, same as low back regarding treatment. Uh, for neck injuries, the most important thing is that you recognize is this a muscle injury or is it a nerve and if you feel it in your arm don't think that your arm has any problems it's your neck that's shooting that signal because the disc protruded if it's just a localized like you can't turn or look left or look right that just means you pull the muscle essentially in the neck and it's just going to take a few weeks of you know icing healing maybe seeing someone who can massage it rub it out a little bit we do some cupping with our friend david which is amazing take out some of the stagnant blood and uh, let new blood flow rush in all by way of saying, if it's muscular, then it should heal quickly, icing, resting, recovering. Uh, maybe a couple weeks. If it's actually nerve, that might be several months while you feel this tingling sensation, do not let it get aggravated in that case. Now, of course, if that's the case, you definitely wanna go see a doctor and find out how, how bad of a protrusion, you might, a disc protrusion you might have in your neck to see what level of precaution you need to take to keep training. Now, once you've talked to a doctor, once you've, you're on your way back, once you're feeling better, the injury's feeling better, then let's talk about training modifications for the neck. Number one is you don't wanna be in any position, generally you don't wanna be in any position where you can't control the person's grabbing of your head. Okay, and let's talk about positions where them grabbing your head is the most common. Well, if I'm in the bottom of closed guard, I can work bottom of closed guard as long as you're not gonna be neck cranking me and I'm aware of that. But even for you, if you had a neck injury, mm -hmm. this is a problem because I'm gonna try to break your posture. I'm gonna do that by ripping on your head. So it's almost more risky once you have an injury, not getting the injury, because this is not gonna injure you at all. But once you have an injury, this is more risky to be in here, because I'm gonna wanna sit up, bring it, now try to stand up. You should, maybe doing this kind of stuff, pulling your head down, you see? So that's why it's risky to be in the guard from that situation. Now, uh, another position that might be risky lay down is bottom of the half guard, right? So you're in positions like this, where the person is cross-facing you and smashing you and doing this, or doing this, or doing this, or doing this, so things where they can grab your head at will. However, being on top of the half guard, neck tweaking is not as common as it is from inside the guard. So positions that you can do, top half guard, you can be top side control, right? I can be here drilling, no problem, safe for the neck, because it's not a huge concern of him messing with my neck from here. More of a concern of me messing with his neck. So if I was recovering from an injury, I'd wanna be top half guard, top side control, and top mount. The one exception is that uh, and one time, uh, something that can cause injury as well, is if you're here and someone goes for a trap and roll, roll me out, I might push my head on the ground to stabilize and not get rolled. People use their head as a base point. I will say that if you're recovering from a neck injury, you do not want to use your head as a base point. So, just roll, just go with the flow. And when you're recovering from an injury, it's important that your partner knows that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you're recovering. So you let them know and say, hey, just don't wrench on my neck too much, don't grab my head at all and uh, we can work whatever positions you want. But I'm looking to work mainly top side, top half guard, top mount, and maybe bottom guard, but not to the extent that you may get stacked, right? So bottom guard, bottom open guard, 
is safe for the neck and for the low back without any serious compromising of injury. Anything else for them on this one? No, that's pretty much it, you guys. Um, like I said, don't be too stubborn on anything. This goes with everything. Um, deep stacks, even neck cranks. It might not be a choke. It may not feel like a submission, but I mean, if you're stuck, you're stuck. Just tap and uh, no injury. Good point. It. Yeah, if someone's able to get, my dad always said this, never let the big guys in fights get you in headlocks. Because if a big guy gets you in a headlock, it doesn't have to be accurate or a choke. Mm -hmm. like a, it just has, like a Josh Barnett style, it just has to wrap your neck and make your life miserable and you're gonna tap out. So when you're sparring, if someone gets that solid of a lock on your neck, whether it's a Dars or a guillotine or a Peruvian necktie or something or a can opener or a neck crank of any sort, you have to ask yourself, man, did they get me right here? Did they surprise me? Mm. And if they surprised you and got your neck wrenched up like that, then you ask yourself, if they had 100 pounds more than they do right now in terms of power and size, might this submit me? And if right. you say yes to that question, what you do? Tap out and say, he got me. In other words, don't take advantage of the fact that your partner's lighter than you or smaller than you and say, oh, they don't got me right here and it's not a choke, so I'm not gonna let go. That's when you walk away with a tweaked neck and I've had many of those, you guys, so many, because I was 13, 14 years old, rolling with grown-ups. In my mind, I was thinking, man, I gotta fight and defeat these grown-ups. I gotta defend the Gracie family honor, so I'm not gonna tap no matter what. They rip, they twist. That's how my back got, that's how it all got injured. It's always an ego thing saying, I'm not gonna tap this, it's not real. When the reality is I could have tapped and kept going. No one was keeping tabs and I would have learned better not to let it happen next time. That's the bottom line. Knees, let's talk about knee injuries in Jiu Jitsu. So common, so common. Uh, the most recent two knee injuries came from the same situation, which is um, locked down from half guard. So we're here, this person opens it up, locks it up. So this person did a situation where they were sitting this way. The person in my position was twisting the knee this way like trying to roll them over this way and off balance, maybe coming under. But Alex, insist on going back to where you came from. Like twist your body facing this way. That's where it happened. So basically this battle of coming under, going over, coming under, going over, and the extension here, one person's body went one way, the leg was so fixed in here that it went the other way, so the person's knee popped. ACL tear, six month resting because of a lockdown, twisting side to side. Ironically, the other injury was after a sweep, boom coming up right here, straighten your leg a little bit. The leg stayed in and I didn't see it, but from here, if you straighten your leg, straighten your leg to get out. He straightened his leg within the lockdown and the guy who was doing the lockdowns knee popped. In other words, what's the moral of this story right here? The rubber band is very tight. So if you're using that type of entangled leg configuration, um, it's so tight, it's so stuck that the doer and the doee both are at risk for just the rubber band being pulled too tight. And then when a body goes a little bit in one direction that it wasn't expecting it, there goes your knee. Theirs or yours, we don't know. Even the person doing the sweep, um, in, in Vinny's case, he was doing it and his knee popped from entangling the leg, the guy's leg like this. Now, when it comes to leg injuries, there are like back and neck, there are a couple different types. Serious ones and not so serious ones. Like recently I was doing a takedown and I put my knee on the mat, boom, I did an arm drag and my knee hit the mat, boom! And it almost felt like it really um, like, like, like strained the muscle right above my kneecap, all in this the kind of the quad muscle here, like almost stretched. And it was very burning pain, so it was right near my knee. And uh, initially I was like, oh man, it could be an injury. There was no pop noise, but it felt like it stretched and it was very painful and it was very swollen. And uh, anyways, it ended up being just like a muscular bruise, basically, from the impact on the mat, which once again, is, you know, it's been a couple weeks, already feeling way better. Uh, didn't have to go to the doctor or anything. There's no structural damage inside. It's just, you know, a pretty good impact injury. Whereas these twisty ones where you hear like a huge pop, that loud pop is a very serious concern. You gotta go to the doctor. They're gonna, you know, basically check your knee and, uh, and find out if it's a full tear of a ligament or a partial tear or no tear at all. Just maybe a healthy pop sometimes where you know you're like you're cracking a knuckle of some sort, and it, the air or the, uh, the the synovial fluid kind of rushes into the joint. That's different than an actual ligament tearing inside the knee. Have you ever had any of these concerns? Yeah, um, I remember the first time I got knee barred. Uh, I got there, and in general, leg locks they don't feel like arm locks, do right. they? Arm locks right, you can right. tell, fully extended, hurts, a sharp pain, Boom. and you know it's about to happen. When I got caught in this knee bar, I knew I couldn't get out. I felt a little tightness in my hamstring, but I didn't really feel like it was a, it was a lock because it wasn't painful. Mm. Um, just because I couldn't get out, I tapped, 
But the next day as I was walking around, I remember stepping up on a curb and feeling a little instability in my knee, mm. you know? And that's when I realized, you know, even though I wasn't feeling it, some injury had occurred. Wow. So in general with leg locks, if it feels tight, if you can't get out, even if it's not painful, it's worth tapping. Yeah, they're very different from arm locks and shoulder locks in that sense. They don't really hurt that bad before it's too late. And, uh, and that's a huge concern. So generally speaking, uh, you wanna tap before you find out whether your knee can withstand that much pressure and tension. So when it comes to tear of ligaments, it's always a matter of whether it tore entirely, in which case it can't refuse itself, or whether the ligament tore partially and kind of got thinner, and then over time can kind of grow back and get stronger if you protect it and don't let that angle uh, of injury happen again while you're in the recovery phase. So again, recognizing based on a doctor and, 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 and how quickly it's able to heal, whether it's serious or not, and um, that will determine how quickly you get back to training. When it comes time to train with a knee injury, and we've seen a lot of these, so we know from success and experience, typically what the guys are doing is they're coming in, you know, the guy had an ACL surgery, supposed to stay out for six months, came in far too much sooner than that, let me just say that. And uh, so Vinny came in here and basically tied his legs together. So imagine rolling with someone, having your knees bound together to where literally like here, like right at the knees, you literally can't even like get up because your knees can't do anything. They're just stuck together, right? And of course your training partner will not go for leg locks on you. So what does that mean? You're not passing any guards. You're not side mounting anybody. You're not doing anything. You're just literally keeping your legs together and you're playing safe hands, defending 100%, you know, side mount, mount, boom. And your defense gets sharp during this phase of not being able to use either one of your legs to get up or get on top or even shrimp to guard. You can't even put them in the guard because there is no guard because your legs are stuck together. So that's the best method for training and modifying your training when recovering from a knee injury is simply remove your legs from the equation. And uh, you'll know a little bit of what it's like to be Andy Gracie at that point because you're not getting on top of anybody. You're just gonna survive down there and the rain will come and you just gotta defend hand fighting for life. Because even though you're fighting with hands, you can't even bump to escape when they lock in a submission. So it's not like you can emergency escape and get out and get on top and no, you're just gonna basically, yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be rough, but it's gonna be worth it because Think of when you would position yourself in that same training environment willingly with two healthy knees. Probably never, because you want to get out and get on top and breathe a little bit and then attack a little bit. So you definitely don't want to be down there usually. So a knee injury forces you to do that. And even though we don't want anyone to get injured, we can tell you those who've gotten injured and had gone through this phase of bottom defense survival 100% come back much sharper with their safe hands so that when they have two healthy legs, it's ridiculous. No doubt. Cool? Shoulders. I injured my shoulder when I was like 19, nah, a little later, 22, 23, yeah, Grace Academy, Carson Street. I injured my shoulder pretty badly, um, just teaching a basic class. I was like in a headlock, and one of the brand new students um, basically was there and was doing a frame from modified mount like this, was driving forward, and my shoulder was like this, and it went like too high this way, and I felt it like, kak -kak, like a little weird angle, totally unavoidable, wasn't even sparring, something so silly, and ever since I felt like my, my labrum has been a little looser, and my rotator cuff entirely is not as stable on my right arm as my left arm. And as a result, I um, you know, have just constantly worked it out, exercised, doing a lot of shoulder stability exercises, and just stayed on top of it. And as a result, I've been able to avoid surgery and, and strengthen my rotator cuff to the point where it's essentially stable enough to allow me to train hard and no problem. If I lay off my exercises for a period of two to three weeks, it starts to feel a little bit sore, a little bit not so stable and not so healthy. So it reminds me to stay on top of it. And maybe one day I'll have shoulder surgery, but with shoulders, I always feel like it's that. It's a matter of kind of prolonging the shoulder surgery as long as possible and um, within reason, right? As long as you feel good and my body feels perfect right now, it's, uh, it's no problem. But it's an injury, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting ball and socket joint, unlike the other hinge or even the back where you know it's there and the muscles and the ligaments are all there to try to keep it stable and if it gets compromised then it's a matter of trying to keep it back in the pocket how do shoulder injuries occur most common situations what do you think as always uh, arm attacks just being stubborn but in general one that i don't think we uh we talk about a whole lot is uh just reaching too much sometimes let's say we're standing mm -hmm. up um let's say i was going for a single leg or a double leg if i'm coming in like this one of the uh, defenses for Henry is just to sprawl out. And if at this point, I'm way, way too committed to actually keeping my arm right here, right. there's a lot of pressure on the shoulder right there. It just from opens that, yeah, and it's opening the socket and opening that, that socket and that rotator cuff to a point where if he drops weight on that at that mm. point, it can dislocate much easier than if you're tight with your arms. You don't want to dislocate your shoulder. You want to keep your elbow, keep your friends close. 
Keep your enemies closer. Keep your elbows the closest. So tight that uh, you're less likely to get your arm knocked. Boom. Another thing that causes injury in the, in the shoulders is posting. Mm. Right? One of the recent injuries we had here uh, was our friend Rudy, a super dedicated student who trained with Alex Bello. And Alex sat up. And Alex went for the sit-up sweep right here. Boom. He posted way wide. And they kind of like, boom, like that way. To where this just totally hyperextended, opened up that shoulder. And the biceps tendon, like, detached. The biceps tendon detached. And he's like, Henry, I think I broke my arm. I looked at it. I said, no, bro, like, there's no bone broke right here. But his bicep, like, literally had bundled up into his elbow. It was pretty nasty. But uh, he went, had the bicep surgery. And one thing to take from Rudy is he hasn't missed a class since that day. Yeah. Since the day he tore his bicep tendon and had surgery, he's been to every single class that he regularly does with a notebook, walking around the mat with his gi on, with the arm in a sling, observing the situation. This guy has the highest level of dedication and literally didn't want to fall out of his curriculum rhythm, which is very wise. So that's a lot of things what happens. You get injured, you're out for two weeks, and then you get lose motivation, or you forget about it, and then you don't ever come back from a silly injury that you had that was avoidable, and just sidelines you completely. So injuries can be the best or the worst thing that happened to your jiu-jitsu if you don't know how to roll with them. So shoulders. Now, in terms of treatment, once again, it's identifying, is it an actual tear that needs surgery? Or is it a, you know, kind of a, a, a strain of a muscle or a spraining of a ligament that needs to be dealt with slowly and just allow the time to recover? In either case, whenever my shoulder acts up or I twist it and rolling and it's like sore, I basically just tie it down. You guys have seen this in many videos. We've done some on the, there's some YouTube videos where I roll one-handed. I basically put it in and I grab the belt right here. And then I just go, I roll normal, one-handed tied, full lockdown, and I can't use that arm. And I've never aggravated a shoulder injury while tying my arm. I've only aggravated pre-existing shoulder injuries when whirling wildly and thinking it's all good, and then I aggravate it. So if you tie it down, you should be fine. And man, you can't imagine how good that is for your jiu-jitsu to tie one arm down and to roll 100% is ridiculous. The best thing possible. Lastly, of the main injuries is ears, cauliflower ear. People always ask me, Henner, how do you avoid having the big freaking, you know what I'm saying? Freaking cauliflower ear. Well, yeah, my grandfather always said, Henner, the freaking, you know what I'm saying? The nicer the ears, the better the technique. So, obviously, there are some really good technical people with some cauliflower ears messed up pretty badly. Uh, so, it was a very generalized, you know, rule, so to speak. But here's what he meant by that. What he means is this, and, and what's important to understand, the common causes kind of relate to this regarding ear injuries, is when you lead with your head too much, when you're in a situation, why do wrestlers have the most cauliflower ear? Because they start standing up, it's all about the takedown, all they're doing is shooting in with their head, driving their head into their partner's hips, body, legs, shoulders, grinding head to head, tying up in the clinch. So there's so much driving of their head into their opponent that their head is like, taking the brunt of the contact against their opponent's hips and, and the rest of their body. So that's going to cause the, 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 the cartilage to tear in the ear and then it's going to swell up. So generally speaking, um, the reasons why someone who's more technical and less aggressive and more patient with their jiu-jitsu acquires less cauliflower ear is because, you know, they're just kind of, you know, no matter what bad position, come on in, they're just very much safe hands and they're just, you know, I'm not really trying to like, I got to get up, I got to go, boom, and I'm doing it. If you make up your mind that it's time to go and you gotta get out now and you gotta get out now and you have this very sportive time limit, go, 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 aggressive mindset, naturally your head's gonna be diving into the trenches all the time and you're gonna get your ears bumped and naturally it's gonna happen. Now, this is not to say that you couldn't get a kind of a freak accident of a nearby training partner whose foot swings over and hits you in the head and tears the cartilage and swells up your ear. That's possible as well. But generally speaking, driving with your head, be caring too much about go, instead of, hey, okay, no problem, safe hands, protect, just stay there and defend. When he messes up, I'll off-balance him and sweep him. But much less of a time limit mindset and more of a patience, defensive mindset is, um, you know, is where the cauliflower ear comes from the most. Now, don't get it twisted. I bumped my ears, I, they've swelled up, I've had to drain my ears over the years for sure a couple times. Um, but I think one of the distinguishing factors between the people who end up with the freaking huge ears and the people who end up with moderately, you know, uh, how do we say? They're not ugly, but they are, um, they have a character. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
<laughs> the ears where you know they just completely blow up. The difference is very simple. It's in whether or not you train once the inflammation starts. Very simple. So when someone's ear tears and it starts to swell up, the cartilage inside the ear tears, the blood rushes to that area to heal it, right, with oxygenated blood to heal the injury. The problem is that blood pools in the ear and has no way of getting out. So that that blood essentially kind of calcifies or whatever process it goes through, it becomes rock solid in that pocket, okay? And uh, in the, be, before that actually happens though, when you get your ear nicked and a little bit of blood goes there, you're either A, gonna say, okay, I'm gonna you know, get it drained and sit off the mat and not do anything, or B, I'm gonna get it drained or not get it drained, put on some headgear and go roll mm -hmm. and keep going and keep going and keep going. Let me just say this, an ear that is already cauliflower and is soft, in other words, it's a new injury, it's sensitive, it's not calcified yet. A new cauliflower ear is 10, to a hundred times more likely to get bigger than a healthy ear is likely to get cauliflower at all. How do we explain that more clearly? Yeah, you guys, uh, when you drain your ears, by the way, you should wait about four or five days, right? Yeah, typically we wait because the blood goes in there, it rushes in there. If you drain it right away, it's just gonna swell up right away. So typically the ear takes about two to four weeks to heal. So draining it immediately is only gonna allow more blood flow to go in there. It's not that it's wrong, it's just that you can expect to have to drain your ear with uh, the syringe and there's many other YouTube videos that people show, some good, some not so good how to do this. Um, and I recommend you go to a doctor for this obviously, but you get your ear popped open and it's you know swollen, so you drain it out and more blood's gonna rush back in. Even if you don't train, it's gonna rush back in because it's still trying to heal it. Eventually, between 10 and 20 days, when you drain it, it'll stay down because the ear is already healed and there's no more need to throw new blood mm -hmm. in an injury that's already good. And by you extracting the fluid at that point, you're just taking out what would have otherwise kind of calcified and uh, you keep the injury down. Right, and like Henry said, a lot of people, once they get it drained, they think, I'll throw on the headgear, I'll go out there and I'll just train, and since I have the headgear, I'll be protected. Mm. Headgear is mostly about prevention before it happens mm. and less about protection after it's happened. Even if you if you got it Good freshly point. drained and you put on your headgear, when you roll the, the surrounding area. It's, it's almost worse. Yeah. Because if someone hits your headgear, it's just gonna slide. And when it slides, there's a freaking little cup right on your ear that rubs your ear pretty aggressively, probably more so than if you just roll and nobody were just so you see, because if you touch the headgear up here, it's gonna slide the cup over here. So the point is there's something on your ear now that if it slides out of place a little, can aggravate the injury. So he's right, it's more about prevention. You wear headgear to never have your ears get hit not wear headgear once you have an injury to justify keep training because it's going to keep rubbing it and that little small cauliflower is going to grow into a medium cauliflower which is going to eventually grow into a daddy cauliflower and you don't want daddy cauliflower ears some people say that they love it yeah it's dope yeah ask your wife ask your husband if they love it and then decide but uh, at the end of the day drain your ear and sit off the mat the training modification for cauliflower ear is mm -hmm. do nothing Take notes, sit over there, walk around and wait for two weeks while your ear heals. If you train and if you're like dying, literally you're like roll over and die without training, I'll say this, get on the mat and you can do the techniques. If no one touches your head, you can do the techniques, go through technique motions. Do not spar until your ear is no longer sensitive because it'll feel sore while it's still injured. Once it's no longer sensitive and the inflammation is gone and you've had it all extracted, through draining processes over the three, four, five times you drain it over a couple weeks. Then it's healed, then you step back in and you can roll. At that point, put some headgear on, not because it's right away and you're just rolling right after the injury, but put some headgear on so it doesn't happen again fresh, brand new. And uh, until you learn to roll in a way that is more, more safe, safer for your ears, generally speaking. So headgear, it's not protection, it's prevention. Wear it before the cauliflower happens, and your vest off. The problem is it's so uncomfortable that we don't like to wear it sometimes. So then you risk getting your ear nicked. Then you gotta roll in a way where getting your ear nicked is less likely. And that means what? Stop caring so much. And stop leading with your head and stop driving in for the crazy double leg. Because that's how the injuries happen. Leading with your head, head hits against the guy's hip, or head hits against their head, or head gets to their elbow because you're getting out too aggressively. Now I'm not saying you can't train hard, because I train hard, I just try to do it in a way where you know, I protect my head. I don't let my head be running into things because that's not safe for your neck or for your ears. Cool? Cauliflower ear, you guys. Defend against it, keep it playful, be patient, and don't care so much. Now, there's a bonus injury that uh, we'd like to mention now that is the reason for all five of the top listed injuries, and that is the ego when you roll. 
We've talked about this before. At the end of the day, me and Alex Spawn, we can train hard, but our training should never, our training intensity should never exceed our safety consideration for one another. The agreement is I'll roll safely for you if you roll safely for me. I'll roll hard, but safely for you if you roll hard, but safely for me. That's kind of the unanimous agreement here. The problem is if you're, in an, if you're in an academy where that understanding does not exist universally on the mat, then you have a problem because it doesn't matter how safe you roll, someone out there is gonna abuse their privilege or their size or their strength and they're gonna smash on you and they're not gonna let go when you tap or they're gonna roll in a way where something so simple, let's say like you're mounted on me and you, know, you put this hand on the collar. If there's no safety consideration, like straighten this arm a little bit, someone here might say, forget this, I gotta get out and look, boom, and they just might, you see what I'm saying? Like that's rolling in a way where you don't care about this person. You care about getting out. So you go boom and you hyperextend this so fast. There was no control. He had no chance to let go. And now his elbow's jacked for four weeks. He can't roll. He's got to tie his hand. So that's what I'm saying. It's, I'll never do that to Alex. I'll never do something that will consciously hurt him without him having a chance to, of course, like a normal submission, tap out and get up, you know? So that's the most important thing, you guys. Get the ego out of the equation, roll safely, agree to be safe for him, he'll agree to be safe for you, and you're good to go 100%. Honorable mentions, tell me. Can I just add? Sure. The thing with egos is, when you hurt a part of your body, let's say your elbow, you tend in the future to be careful to nurse that elbow and go easy with it. The thing with egos is, it leaves no mark. Right. And when it leaves no mark, this is a, is a constant thing you have to remind yourself, you know? Sometimes I think, I've been on the mat long enough, I'm kind of past the point where I have an ego, but you know, I'll go with a big blue belt, super fit, uh, 220 pounds, and I'll still think to myself, you know what, I should be able to make certain things happen. The ego thing is a constant and journey. And then you go beyond your safe, healthy limits, yes. and that's when injuries happen. Absolutely. Or if that big blue belt catches you in a can opener, in your mind you say a brown belt can't tap to a blue belt, so I'm gonna get out no matter what, I'm gonna die trying. Mm -hmm. And then you get out, yeah. and then you're out for three months with a twisted yeah. neck. And then what did you realize? I should have freaking tapped. No one was watching. Nobody cared. Mm -hmm. And I would be training healthily right now. So it's almost like you have to get injured to have this ego-free mindset and realize it doesn't really matter. Right. This has to happen to you. So we're trying to tell you guys in advance not to let it happen. But when it does, because it will, everyone's going to get injured at some point. When it does, we're telling you how to modify your training so that you can use these to your advantage and ultimately make your jiu-jitsu better from the sidelines. Now, what if it's one of those, like an like a ear injury or a spinal injury where you just can't roll for 10 months? Let me just say this. The 10 months that I was out not training, I never watched Hedon spar so intently in my life as I did during those 10 months. And watching Hedon spar from the sidelines was totally different than watching Hedon spar from the trenches of being smashed by him. When I came back after the injury and slowly started reintegrating, and it was very ego-free mindset, I never rolled so successfully with Hidon than I did right after the 10 months were up and I was back on the mat because I understood him in a way that I never did before. So even when you're not rolling, you're progressing if you adopt this mindset of always progressing, always advancing in categories that you can. Even if that means running up and down a sand hill, getting in better shape because you can't do jujitsu because your cauliflower ear is flared up. Or coming at night and taking notes like Rudy does because your shoulder bicep tendon has been detached from a silly posting of your hand, which is totally accidental and you couldn't have, you know, it's hard to prevent that. Things happen. But more often than not, the injuries happen not from the submission being hyperextended. The injuries happen from a weird position that occurs and two people caring too much about their stakes at that point where blue belt, brown belt, neck crank, I don't want to tap, blah, blah, but whatever the situation is, then the injury happens. And after that happens, right away you say, man, what the heck was I thinking? It was so stupid. Your body is a temple. Treat it as such. Be careful, you guys. And the more safely you train, the more, the more intelligently you train, the longer you're going to get to train for. So it doesn't matter about a neck crank right now, today or tomorrow. What matters is that you're around to see some neck cranks or see anything 25 years from now, 30, 50 years from now, when you're 90 years old and uh, you know, you're still around because you have this resilience and this black belt bounce back factor and a training modification mindset where you know that no matter what the situation is, you can still get better at jujitsu, okay? The honorable mentions, skin. If you have a rash, a ringworm, a staff, a spider bite looking thing, no matter what you have on your skin, if it's not normal and it's an abnormal, like a little, 
like an itchy red patch, you have ringworm. If it looks like a spider bite and it's a boil and it's pussing, that's not a spider bite. You didn't get bit by a spider last night. If you train jujitsu, that's a boil. That's staph infection. If you have like a staph on your neck from shaving and it's growing and it's getting a little bit bigger, that's not a shaving burn and you didn't spill any hot oil from your scrambled eggs on your neck. Your neck is a staph infection that, and I've had all these, so I'm telling you from experience. Your neck is a staph infection that, because you shaved and it opened up some wounds, and the bacteria from training, some staph that you acquired somewhere in a dirty mat, got up and it got in your neck. Even if your mat's clean, like ours is, it can still happen. It's just fungus and bacteria, and it gets in there and it starts to grow. And at that point, you gotta deal with it. So go see a doctor. Don't just put some tape on it and go roll because some of these things are contagious. If you have anything abnormal on your skin or if you see any other students with any skin abnormalities, you have to let the instructor know because you should not be training because that's how we put an end to it. You rest if you have it, everyone else is good, and then boom, we haven't had incidences of staff or ringworm here on the mat for a long time. We, we mop and clean the mat twice a day. Everyone washes their hands with the uh, uh, athletic body care before they come on the mat, so it's a very sanitary environment. But uh, bottom line, it's up to each individual to take responsibility for what's on them, okay? And if you're not sure what it is, don't cover it up and train. Talk to a doctor and then come talk to the instructor and let them assess whether or not so you're not a health risk to everyone else. Rings. Never train with wedding rings. I know some people think, oh, I got to train my wedding ring. No, don't train with your wedding ring. Take your ring, tie it to something else, put it in your car, leave it somewhere safe. It's all good. The only exception is these Kalo rings. Okay, which this ring right here is an absolute, it's a rubber band. Look, it's a very special ring made by a company called Kalo that um, basically does these for firefighters and SWAT guys and people who like to work out and everything else where they don't want it to get too hot in a firefighting suit is where it started from, I guess, whatever. But it's great for jujitsu because you can't scratch and no one's gonna get cut by this as well. If you have a normal wedding band, even a thin little gold band, and you're fighting and I'm on your back and I'm attacking your neck and you're defending your neck and I'm ripping your hands off, I'm gonna be grabbing your hand in every way possible to try to peel it off. And when I grab your hand like this, or I'm pulling a hand off, my knuckle slides on the wedding band and the sharp edge on the inside, not on the outside, but the inside opens and rubs my knuckle and it cuts my knuckle open, okay? Clip your nails, 100%, you shouldn't see any white on the nail, it should be 100% down, and no wedding rings while you train so that that hand fight doesn't cause an unnecessary cut, okay? We know you love your wife, we know you love your husband, we know everything's good, and just trust me, take it off, Put it away. If you have to keep it on, wrap that finger with some tape so it's totally unaccessible to the training partner's hands during hand fighting. Okay? And last but not least, wear a mouth guard while you train. Get a good one done. You can get a cheap one. You can get a nice one done by a dentist. Keep it in your mouth guard pocket. Even while you're drilling, get a mouth guard that you can actually talk with. Don't worry about it being one of those ones that have both the top and bottom bite. That's not necessary. They're too clunky. You can't talk. You can hardly breathe while you're wearing it and um, they're uncomfortable and you never want to wear them because they feel like you're biting on a big freaking piece of pineapple. So keep this just in the top piece right here and uh, you can still talk, you can still breathe, it's not an annoyance. Most importantly for the mouth guard, you guys, is not high impact getting punched in the head. The most important thing for the mouth guard is your teeth don't collide with one another and you don't chip your teeth. I chipped my teeth like at least 16 times as a kid. Just my teeth rubbing small, but they just kind of rub and they grind, totally unnecessary. And now I just roll with the mouth guard every time. And uh, it's much safer and you avoid the silly injuries, okay? It's, uh, you only get one nice set of teeth when you grow up and let's try to keep that preserved 100%. Cool. What else, Alex? Final thoughts for our friends. Again, you guys, no injury is worth all of this. Yeah. It's worth listening. It's worth training without an ego. You guys, we'll end on this. When this rubber band gets tight, go with it. And when he rips back on the rubber band, hey, nice to meet you. It doesn't matter if he's from your school or, pull again, from another school and he's visiting, don't care so much that someone gets hurt. All right? At the end of the day, the enemy is not on the green mat. The enemy is out there. And like Hidon would say, like Hidon always says, when's the last time you had a sparring session in your academy that really mattered? And we mean mattered like those stakes were life or death. Never. You've never had a sparring session in your academy that actually mattered to the point where a ridiculous injury was justified. Now, why does it happen? The ego. We already talked about it, you guys. Much respect. If you listen to this advice, you will make your injuries, which will happen accidentally, sometimes they're unavoidable, you will make your injuries work for you. Like Andy Gracie made his weaknesses 
and his disability and his frailty work for him. And if he did what he did with his little body and his frailness, imagine what you can do with yours. Much respect. Thank you, Alex, for being here. We hope this saves a few necks. See you guys in the next one.